Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Dining with the Damned, where we discuss people who have been sentenced to die. We talk about their lives, their crimes, how they ended up on death row, and then I show you and taste their last meal before execution. Hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me, and you can always join my Patreon. We have a big goal there. I'll talk about that at the end of the video. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. When we talk about cold-blooded reptilian psychopaths here in the true crime community, a lot of people's minds go directly to serial killers, to the Ted Bundys and the John Wayne Gacy's and the Richard Ramirez types. But after you've spent a lot of time in the true crime community, studying the monsters who inhabit that space, you are more than well aware those are the one percenters. The very famous monsters often talked about in the true crime genre are only a teeny little piece of the overall puzzle. There are thousands and thousands of monsters that most people will never hear about. And there are thousands and thousands of people who have done things just as bad, if not worse, than the very famous killers that are household names. But even those of us who are well seasoned and immersed in the true crime world sometimes forget when you hear the words psychopathic maniac, you could be talking about a woman. Yes, it is much more likely for men to commit violent acts than it is for women. Yes, most killers are men. Men are also five times more likely to be psychopaths than women are, according to current research. But there are those that believe the gender disparity is not that high. It's just that female psychopaths are harder to detect than male psychopaths are. And today, there is little doubt we are talking about one of the most prolific psychopaths in history. This is Judy Bueno Año. You've probably never heard of her, but those who have, those who have studied her are in agreement. She is one of the most evil and cold-blooded people they've ever researched. It isn't that she killed a lot of people, it's that she tortured people. It's the way she viewed other people who made her so different from most of us. By the way, I did a bunch of research on how to pronounce her last name and couldn't find any websites that had that listed as a last name. And then I found out why. She made it up. I'm gonna tell you how that came to be in a little bit, but yeah, it's Bueno Año and it's supposed to be Spanish for good year, but she didn't entirely understand Spanish when she made up her last name. Judy was a shark of a human being. She lived her life in a manner that would very quickly clue someone in psychology into what she was. But the average everyday person would simply call her cold, selfish, and mean. Judy Welty was born on April 4th, 1943 in Quinault, Texas. Her mother died when she was only four years old and Judy was sent to live with her grandparents. Her father remarried and he took Judy and her brother to live in Roswell, New Mexico, where Judy claims she was abused. As an adult, Judy said her father and then her stepfather abused her by starving her and forcing her to work as a slave. It's tough to know just what to think as the details of Judy's early life are lost to the ages, but we do know that when she was 14 years old, she attacked her stepbrothers, her father, and her stepmother with a knife. She went to juvenile jail for about two months, and when she was released, she was told she must stay in school. Judy actually chose to go to reform school because it meant living away from her family. She wanted to live away from her family. She graduated from that reform school in 1960, and then she got a license to become a nurse assistant. In 1960, Judy was unmarried and found herself pregnant. She gave birth to her son, Michael, when she was only 17 years old. After Michael was born, Judy met an Air Force sergeant named James Goodyear, and after dating for a few months, the couple was married in 1962. After that, their own children followed, James Jr. and Kimberly. For a few years, everything seemed quite normal and very typical for that time in America. The Goodyear family then moved to Orlando, Florida, where James was reassigned to a strategic air command base at McCoy Air Force Base, which is now the Orlando International Airport. Shortly after the family moved, James was sent to fight in the Vietnam War. He was gone for about two years and returned home in 1971. Kind of a side note, I watched a documentary on how the wars affected the generation that came after them. 
um, the late baby boomers and my generation, Generation X, how we were raised with kind of a generation of missing fathers. Even a lot of fathers that were present in the home physically were not there mentally because of the wars. Just a side note, but I love talking about that stuff. And Judy kind of reminds me of one of those kids that was really affected by the fact that everyone in her life had been in a war and that changes people. When James returned from the war, he was, of course, war-worn and different, but happy to be home. He was in good health at that time, but that did not last. Just a few months after returning home from the war, James began to suffer with a mysterious illness. He had good health care through the military, and it got to the point where he was seeing the doctor almost once a week. They ran all kinds of tests, but could never get to the bottom of what was causing James terrible stomach pain, headaches, and weakness. By September of 1971, James Goodyear was dead. Judy collected $28,000 in life insurance and $64,000 in Veterans Administration benefits. That's almost $724,000 today. So it was a huge chunk of money for Judy. So now you kind of know where we're going with this story, right? What kills me about these types of killers is you'd think if they stopped, after the first time, a lot of them would get away with it. I'm glad that's not the case, but they can't stop some of them. It is the strangest thing to me. You'd think that if you got away with something really bad once, you'd be like, whew, you know, lucky me and move on. But that's not what they do. Judy collected her widow's inheritance and then decided she was going to take her kids and move from Orlando to Pensacola, Florida, where she used some of the money to purchase a nice home. Once settled in Pensacola, Judy met this man, Bobby Morris, and they began dating in 1972. The two never legally married, but lived together and raised the kids together. A couple of years into their relationship, Bobby Morris decided he was moving to Colorado and Judy followed him there. I bet you will never ever guess what happened next. Bobby began to exhibit the same symptoms that James had experienced. Stomach pain, headaches, nausea, intestinal troubles, and once again, doctors could not seem to find the cause. Bobby was tested and he was treated, but his treating physicians were never able to determine what was making Bobby sick, and they were never able to help him. In 1978, Bobby Morris died. Now, one of the strange facts of this case is that two sets of doctors, one set in Florida and one in Colorado, each ruled that the men had died of heart attacks. Back in the 50s and 60s, younger men dying of heart attacks was not that uncommon. And the diagnosis of heart attack seemed to be the catch-all for whenever they could not determine what had actually killed someone. So both of these men were ruled to have died of heart attacks, even though they were in different states with different sets of doctors. I mean, medicine's come a long way, but yeah, that was just kind of the diagnosis when you didn't know what the death was actually from. Once again, Judy collected on three separate life insurance policies taken out on Bobby Morris. I had a hard time finding exact amounts on this death. Different sites had different amounts, but Judy got her cash and moved on. This is when Judy decided to change her name. Judy decided to call herself Judy Bueno Año, which is a grammatically incorrect Spanish translation of Goodyear. So now Judy's got herself a fancy last name and another new house, and for a while, she's comfortable. For a short while. By 1979, Judy's firstborn son, the one born out of wedlock, Michael, had joined the U.S. Army to follow in James Goodyear's footsteps. But soon after joining the Army, once again, the main man in Judy's life begins to experience mysterious symptoms. Her own son. Michael began having the same ailments as both of his stepfathers. He had incredible stomach pain, he had nausea, intestinal issues, and terrible headaches. Now, this time, Army doctors did diagnose Michael with arsenic poisoning. We're going to talk about what happens here in a second, but I find it interesting that nobody at the time said, you know what, um, Judy has two ex-husbands or two husbands, dead husbands, that have died of some mysterious illness, the symptoms of which are nausea, headaches, intestinal troubles. It, you know, there was no computer network to join all of the records together. We can't be too critical but it, it took him a while. 
So Michael was discharged from the army due to his illness. The army ended up blaming his exposure to arsenic on his time in the service. Believe it or not, they did not trace this back to Judy. Michael got so sick that in order to walk, he required the use of heavy metal leg braces just to move about. Now, this is the kind of evil I'm talking about. Yes, it's evil to strangle someone. It's evil to shoot someone. But it is a different kind of evil to sit and watch a human being suffer for months on end, knowing that you are the one causing them to suffer, especially your own child. In 1980, Judy Buenoano took her son Michael on a canoeing trip in Florida's East River. Yes, you heard that right. And as you've probably guessed, while on this canoeing trip, the canoe capsized. Judy swam back to shore and Michael drowned being weighed down by the leg braces he was forced to wear because his own mother had been poisoning him for almost a year. Evil, just pure, unadulterated evil. After Michael's death, the police and the insurance company ruled it an accident at first. For a third time, Judy collected a large insurance settlement from a policy she had taken out on her own son. She grabbed that cash and went on with her life just as she had always done. But this is when Judy finally slips up to the point that her murderous ways get the attention of the authorities. Judy began dating this man, John Gentry, a wallpaper salesman. John later recalled, Judy was standing at the bar, all dressed in black. She wore black quite a lot, in fact. Psychologically, I think that says a lot about her. Judy told John that they should take out life insurance policies on each other. John didn't see anything wrong with the idea and was actually pleased that Judy was watching out for him by taking out a policy on herself. So Judy became the beneficiary of a $500,000 policy on John and with that, she got back to work. First, Judy tried poisoning John with vitamin C overdoses. John got very, very sick and even went to the hospital, but he didn't die. Judy had to try something else. She'd been poisoning the men in her life for years. She'd drowned her own son. And now she was going to try blowing someone up. Around 10.30 at night on June 25th, 1983, in Pensacola, John Gentry walked outside of a restaurant towards his car that was parked nearby. He got in the driver's seat, put the key in the ignition, and turned on the lights. The Ford exploded in a flash of light and tiny bits of metal that were sent flying into John Gentry's body. John was thrown from the car and lay bleeding on the pavement. Judy, who was still inside the restaurant, hanging back just a bit, ran to John and cradled his head in her lap. She told him, I love you. The ambulance came and took John Gentry away. He underwent emergency surgery and ended up losing parts of his intestines, kidney, liver, and pancreas. But John Gentry survived. That was not Judy's plan. And unbeknownst to her, the cops were finally onto her. As the police investigated the car explosion, they pieced the bomb back together. They were able to trace some of the parts used to build the bomb back to a local supply store, and as they worked with the shop owner to trace the purchase, they found the receipt. Whose name was on that receipt? Judy Buenoano. The police got a warrant and found the same tape and the same wire that was used in the bomb in Judy's bedroom. Then it all came together very quickly. They found out that two of Judy's former husbands had died of mysterious illnesses and that her son was crippled by a mystery illness and then drowned in a river when Judy was the only other person present. James and Bobby's bodies were exhumed and testing was performed. Both men had died of arsenic poisoning. Then police got a hold of the vitamin C capsules Judy had been giving to John Gentry. They were loaded with paraformaldehyde. Judy Buenoano was arrested and put on trial. In 1984, she was convicted of the murder of her son, Michael, and she was convicted of the attempted murder of John Gentry. In 1985, she was convicted of the murder of her first husband, James Goodyear. Prosecutors didn't feel they could get a conviction on Bobby Morris, so that case never went to trial. 
Judy got 12 years for trying to kill John, she got a life sentence for killing her son, and she got the death penalty for killing James Goodyear. She was also convicted on a slew of charges for grand theft by insurance fraud. Oh, and one other thing, one of the houses Judy had purchased with that illegally obtained insurance money had burned down. She'd also gotten an insurance settlement for that, so she was charged with arson as well. She, she's like a mastermind criminal, and she got away with it so many times. Judy was sent to the Florida Department of Corrections Broward Correctional Institute and put on death row. At the time, no female had ever been executed in the electric chair. Judy would be the first. On March 30th, 1998, Judy Buenoano was moved from her cell to the death watch cell. She was allowed to speak with her spiritual advisor and she was given her last meal request, which of course I'm going to show you. She was then led to the death chamber and was strapped into the electric chair. She barely filled the seat. This tiny woman had committed horrific acts and she was asked if she had any last words. She replied simply, no sir. Judy then squeezed her eyes tightly shut and kept them that way, not looking at the witnesses behind the partition. The switch was thrown and smoke began to curl around Judy's right leg. For 38 seconds, the smoke grew and filled the room and then it was over. Judy Bueno Año, age 54, was dead. So what did this incredibly evil black widow and child killer request and receive for her last meal? I'm gonna show you. I can pretty much promise that most of us would not request this for our last year, but I get it and I'll tell you why. For her last meal, Judy Bueno Año requested a bowl of strawberries, asparagus and broccoli, and hot tea. Now, what I've learned from you guys about prison is that they do not get fresh vegetables or fresh fruit in prison. So this makes sense. Now, I would need a big steak and some crab legs, a baked potato with tons of butter, maybe some fried shrimp. <laughs> I would need some stuff to go with this, but I do love vegetables and I do love fruit and it would be really hard not to have them. So let's give it a taste. A beautiful little strawberry. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't had a strawberry for a long time, that would taste like heaven. It still tastes like heaven and I had one this morning. Broccoli, I'm having mine with butter and salt and pepper because I like myself. Mm. I love broccoli. Mm. Mm -hmm. I could eat a big plate of broccoli every day, but I am having it with butter till the day I die. I'm gonna die with a little extra fat on my bones and I'm gonna die happy. Asparagus, I love asparagus. I like mine pan seared in a little olive oil with salt and pepper. I don't like it boiled. This one's a little more erect. A little livelier. A cup of hot tea. This is ginger tea. Oh, that's good. I'm a tea drinker. I do not drink coffee. It does not agree with me, but I definitely love my tea. Well, it's kind of rabbit food. But this is what Judy Buenoano requested and it's what she got. And it isn't the only thing she got on that day. I think she also got what she deserved. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Dining with the Damned. Hit the like button if you like the video, subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more from me. And you can always join my Patreon. If you wanna donate a couple dollars a month, that helps. It helps keep the channel alive. And in the end, we have a big goal. We would like to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage.
that cannot be tested because there's no money to test it. There are thousands of sexual assault kits sitting in refrigeration that have never been tested, and we want to get those tested. There's two main reasons. The first is obviously to solve the case the DNA is associated with, and the second is to get that perpetrator's DNA in the system in case they've committed other crimes. It costs between five and $750 to test each kit. So it's a big goal, but I'm not giving up. I sure appreciate you spending a little bit of your day with me today. It means more to me than I will ever be able to tell you. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.